Well, good morning. Good rainy Sunday, and uh, we uh, we need the rain. It's springtime. Something about April showers and May flowers and all of that good stuff. And uh, it's good to see you out this morning. And I, I always uh, found it um, well grateful, especially when when I worked in bus or van ministry, uh, that it seemed to be Sundays were predominantly sunny. And that just makes things a whole lot easier. Uh, when you're dashing between doors and buses and it's raining, it just, um, well, you just need a little extra grace on days like that. And, uh, but uh, Lord, Lord gives us the rain as, as we need it. It's good to see you, see you here this morning. Let's open with prayer this morning. Anybody have any prayer requests that you would like to share this morning? We could help you bear that burden as we pray together. Let's pray for. Okay, all right. Let's pray for Van and surgery upcoming on June the second. Remember my dad also married. He's not doing well right now. All right. All right. Turn her both the streets. All right, let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the opportunity that we have to gather together in such a place as this this morning and, and come collectively to worship you, to learn uh, what you have for us. And Lord, we pray that you would just help in, in this Sunday school uh, time. You see those that, uh, Lord, that have special burdens on, on their hearts. And we pray for Van as he faces this upcoming surgery beginning of June. And Lord, that you would... Um, just uh, help it to go smoothly to accomplish what it needs to. And, and we pray that you would just um, give him the touch as that surgery comes and goes and the recovery afterwards. And, and Lord, that your will be done. We pray for the Stroops, and Lord, uh, both of them in a special way today. And Lord, that you would just be near them. And Lord, Brother Stroop has been in urgent care. And Lord, that you would just uh, touch him physically today. Lord, that you might uh, just be near him in a special way. Lord, others that maybe carrying uh, special burdens and concerns. And Lord, we're glad that you care about each and every one of our lives on, on an intimate and a very uh, detailed level. And Lord, we're grateful that we can come to you with our burdens and our, our cares and, and cast them at your feet because we know that you care for us. You're interceding for us this morning. And Lord, we take comfort in that and we come with you, to you in confidence knowing that you hear our prayers and that you are there for us each and every step of the way. Lord, we pray that you would just help in services throughout this day. You would just be here in a special way. Lord, that you would uh, speak to each heart. And Lord, give us admonishment as we have need of. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> well, we've been continuing to work through um, in this series on um, building Christian relationships. And uh, uh, we come to one entitled uh, Building Family Relationships. And uh, certainly it's an important dynamic, um, not just in our own four walls of our house, but um, it, it, the effect of that radiates outward and not only do our church, but our towns, our nation, and around the world. And so it's an important thing. And how do we cultivate and build those family relationships? The key verse of the lesson comes out of uh, Psalms 127, and verse 1. It says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. And uh, certainly, unless the Lord does help us in building our homes, um, there's, there's something lacking. Unless he's the center of it, unless he's the orchestrator of it, um, there's going to be something lacking. And, uh, um, but I'm thankful that we can build our, our homes, our church, um, our, our, our Christian faith um, on and around the Lord. And, and a central truth of the lesson uh, is listed as a Christian home should follow God's uh, relational principles 
And I hope as we work through this lesson that um, maybe each of us on a, on a personal level um, would, would maybe to see some ways or maybe the Lord would speak to us in some way that we can um, make our, our homes stronger and a, and a better place um, to live. And our culture has, seems to take a, a take it or leave it mentality uh, on the family and the centralized home. Uh, the statistic that 50% of first marriages uh, fail uh, is baffling. It's still, a, it's still a, 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 a current statistic, maybe even a little better than 50%. Um, uh, psychology today, though, they state that second and third marriages actually fail at a higher rate. Second marriages fail 67% of the time, and third marriages fail 73% of the time. To me, that's even more baffling. Um, so if at first you don't succeed in marriage, there's less a chance of success after that. And I read another startling statistic that said in, in this was from 2022, there were more than 15.7 million kids living in a single parent home. 15.7 million kids. Um, and really, there, there's no wonder that there's, there's um, such a mess in our society, the disconnect of of what we think as a normal home um, for many is not there. And no, one, no wonder people are confused about what role they're supposed to play in society. Kids that don't have fathers. And I actually just, I came across a, uh, and this I was, isn't even in my notes, but I, had, I was actually scrolling through Facebook Marketplace and saw an ad for uh, an organization that their whole premise is taking boys especially that come from single parent or don't have a father and they 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 pretty much use the the activities of the field hunting and outdoorsmanship and camping and those kind of things to connect with these kids and it's a, it's a national organization and and it just it was interesting to read through that and there was an organization that was trying to fill that gap in in kids lives who father were were fathers were non-existent and uh, so it, it's no wonder people are confused in, in, in what role they're really supposed to play. It's been said that as the family goes, so goes the nation and so goes the world. On the flip side of all of that chaos, that seems kind of demoralizing. And if we just stopped right there, we'd be like, shake our heads and be like, what, what a mess we're in. Um, but on the flip side of all of that chaos, there ought to be a shining example that's set on a hill, so to speak, um, and, and that shining beacon should be the Christian family who reveals love and strength that exemplifies Christ's love and sacrifice in the order that he set up. We, we ought to want to do everything that we can uh, to strengthen our Christian homes um, to maintain that beacon and that ray of hope to a world that's lost its way. And, and not because we're anything special. Uh, you, you and I are, are nothing special, but it takes meaning because Christ, if he's living in us and he's a part of our home, if he's the central uh, factor of, of guidance of our home and our families, that should make all the difference. That makes all the difference in, in a home. And solid, good families, they just don't happen. Uh, they're cultivated. Uh, they're built, unless, unless our houses are built on the foundation of the Lord. They, we, we labor in vain to, to build something, to, to make some existence of a relationship and a marriage and a family. They're, they're built, they're consistently worked at uh, to maintain a Christ-like and a Christ-centered and a Christ-honoring family. And uh, I, I don't profess to have all the answers this morning. Um, and honestly, as I progress through the stages of, of life, um, the, the scarier the next steps get. And uh, maybe the feeling of being overwhelmed or underprepared or uh, not knowing what's going to happen, um, it becomes greater. Anybody with me this morning? Um, 
those, those next stages. We're, we're all working through different stages. And some of you have lived my lifetime already. Your kids are raised. Uh, they turned out okay. They're living God-honoring lives. They're serving Jesus. And uh, I, I'm still at the beginning, the beginning end of that, uh, that lifetime of, of learning and, and education on parenting and child rearing. But it, it, remind, it, it flashed back in my mind to my early days of pastoring, and I, I was trying to push as hard as I possibly could to pull the train down the track. And in the midst of all of that struggle and effort, um, there was a, a family in my church that uh, things, were not, things were not going well. Um, you didn't even have to be clued into all the details to know that things were a little rough at home, or a lot rough at home. And that husband and that wife, um, who were old enough to be my parents and some in the realm of, of ranges of ages, um, they came to me as their pastor, who at that time was a single guy, for advice. And I was like, unbelievable. How am I a single guy who knows nothing about marriage personally? What was I to tell them? Um, well, these are all the things that, you know, I've come to know that you need to do in a marriage to make it successful. No, I didn't have any of that history. I, personally, I had nothing to give them. But I had a book of principles that are applicable to every one of us. And so as I sat down with them and pleading for God to give me wisdom and grace uh, to work through their situation and point them to biblical principles to share with them and to restore and heal their marriage in some level. And thank to God and his grace and healing. They're, they're still married today, um, at least the last that I knew. And uh, that was numbers of years ago. And, and so I like to feel like we we're, we're some intersection in their life to point them back to godly principles. And, and if you follow these principles, things will go a, a lot better in your life. And so I stand before you today much with the same feeling as I did back then. I don't have a wealth of personal history of, of parenting and, and marriage. It's 13 years. That's, that's all um, to stand before you with. But we will refer you to one who has all the answers um, and, and his word that can guide us. And so let's, let's try and unpack this, this idea today of building family relationships. The first, the first uh, section talks about God's order for marriage, and it's a longer passage, so I think what I'd like to do, we haven't done this in a while, so we'll see how it goes. Um, I think I'm going to ask you as a, as a class to read the bold print in your, in your lesson quarterly or leaflet. I'll read the light in print, and we'll just work down through this until um, we conclude down through here. So we started off in Ephesians, and then we transitioned to a couple other passages of similar thoughts. But Ephesians chapter 5, starting verse 31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Nevertheless, let every one of you in, a, in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Let it be the hidden heart, uh, hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even uh, ornament, uh, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of a great price. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye uh, do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, 
Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as, in, as is fit in the Lord. So if I, and it is the question, it's not rhetorical, so I want, I want you to give me some, some a word. Um, I, I want you to think of one word, or a hyphenated word if you want to get that complicated, that describes a God-ordered marriage. Somebody just talk to me. Forgiveness? Okay, good. Unselfishness? What is it? Love? Sure. Sure. A marriage goes rough without love. What else? Mutual honor and respect. Okay. Honor, respect. I have both of those written down. What else? Devoted. Devoted? Sure. Sure. It takes a lot of devotion. Yeah, I had several of those written down, and some of you thought of that, that I, I didn't just jot down off the top of my head. But certainly all those things are. They're elements. And, and as, we, as we have God in the center of our, our, our marriage, um, we think in those, in those veins. If we were to go out on the street and say, give me a word that describes a God-ordered marriage, um, you'd probably get more looks of confusion than he would have appropriate answers. But I, I do believe it's a biblical principle and uh, that, that marriage is between one man and one woman together for life. And as the Bible points out, the man will leave and cleave to his wife and uh, they, they start walking down the road of life together. And some people love weddings. I mean, they would go to a wedding every week if they could, um, if they had that many friends. Um, and uh, they, they just love weddings. Um, to me, I never was, uh, had that infatuation with weddings. Uh, they're, a sim- they're, they're a symbolic formality of a very special and important time in two people's commitment to love and to live how God intended. Um, and, and as I, there again, I flash back, and I remember when Jennifer and I were uh, dating and got engaged, we lived 1,100 miles apart, and so it wasn't just, uh, well, I'm going to go see my girlfriend this weekend, or tonight and tomorrow and the next day. Uh, it, you know, it was strategically planned out when, when we were going to make this happen. And, and I remember as leading up to those days um, in getting married, it was kind of like, uh, you know, yeah, sure, whatever you want. And it seemed like more like I showed up and I swept the bride off her feet and I carried her northward and we started life together. A special part of life? Absolutely. But then the work begins. It takes work after that, that, uh, that honeymoon phase. And hopefully there is a honeymoon phase and all the love and the bliss and the love just oozes out of that newlywed couple and uh, all is roses and, and uh, uh, flower-lined pathways and pie in the sky, and there's just not a problem in the world. And I remember as a wedding gift, uh, somebody gave us a, uh, some tickets to go to a love and respect uh, marriage conference, and uh, a couple of the principles I bring out here in, in this section um, come out of some of that that they shared and uh, has anybody ever been to Love and Respect Marriage Conference? Video conference, however? Okay, a couple of you. And they come out of this passage in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 33. And, but after that honeymoon phase, then, then we seem to notice the bumps and the things that don't go so rosy and circumstances that just begin to jostle us a little bit. And we find out that the roses actually do have thorns. And things just aren't so rosy at times. Things hurt. And uh, in that love and respect conference, uh, Dr. Emerson and Sarah Eggerich, they call this the crazy cycle. And uh, the cycle says that without love, she reacts without respect. And without respect, he reacts without love. 
and the cycle that begins to spiral out of control with unbelievable damage because the principles that we read this morning have a circular effect, a cyclical, cyclical refle uh, reflection of the breakdown of God's principles. And they call it the crazy cycle. But God had it figured out before he ever made us, man and woman, and the special way that we are wired, the love and respect material, um, they use the pink and the blue headphones. Um, guys, for example, your wife wears the pink headphones, you wear blue headphones, and they point out how differently we react to the same thing. We say one thing, what, what I intend to say, and I say very clearly to my wife, she doesn't hear it that way in her pink headphones. And honestly, when I say it through my blue megaphone, something gets lost in translation to this wonderful woman that God has put by my side. And why is that? Because we all have a different perspective. A man and a woman have different perspectives. We have different needs. We have different ways in which we feel valued. And how our needs are met is, is different. And when I love my wife, I, I meet her deepest needs of wanting to feel loved and appreciated and honored as a woman. And when my wife respects me as a man of the house and the leader of our home and, and the, the God placed, um, in that God placed position in our home, she meets my deepest need, the need for respect and and honor. And when one side is lacking, it may cause a carelessness in meeting the other's need, which turns in careless of meeting the other person's need. And the cycle just goes round and round and round, the crazy cycle. And it's a crazy notion that he can be unloving to get respect, and she can be disrespectful to get love. It's a crazy notion, it's insanity. And I wish there was time to share more of the material that, that they shared, um, but you just have to sign up and go to it. Um, some incredibly important things, and probably, I, I, mean, I sat there as a newly married man and was like, wow, wow. And so if it can be applied, it saves some heartache and some strife and some figuring out. And I wish I had more time to share their material, but as I look back through that workbook, just, just in the time that I was preparing for this lesson, um, it, it's a lot of good stuff in there. Another of the love and respect principles is that his love motivates her respect, and her respect motivates his love, and there again, it's a circle that keeps on going. His love motivates her respect, and her respect motivates his love. And it keeps on going around. And really, that's the beautiful thing. They call that the energizing cycle because it's following the principles that God has laid out. And husbands, love your wives and wives, respect your husbands. It's a God-ordained principle. And it's really living out the principle here in Ephesians and 1 Peter and Colossians. It's God's order for marriage that really works if we apply it. The world has some mixed up perspectives. Often, the world's perspectives are on the things that don't really matter. I just heard someone talking about this, the, sports, the sports world. We focus so much on the sports world, it doesn't matter. It's a frivolous thing. In fact, in fact, and here again, I'm going to get in trouble. This isn't in my notes. But historically, way back, even into, the, into the, the emperors of Rome and such, they built the Colosseum and had sporting events to distract the attention from, of people what was actually going on. And then this person, as he was unraveling this, this thought paradigm, um, the same thing is happening today. We're so involved in things that don't matter that we lose track of the things that really do matter. One of them we're talking about today. Our world is so mixed up in its perspectives, a focus that doesn't really matter. First, First Peter chapter 3 and verse 3 just addresses some of these things. And I'm not going to go down the list of standards the list this morning, but simply to say that the world's values come from the deceitful outside facade that is so important in the world, but really in what's really important, it really 
it really is not what we should be focusing on. I'm trying to do all of those things, the superficial things, but it's not building the family relationship that God intends for us to be building. And when those things are focused on, instead of the core values, the real true issues of what it takes to make a marriage work, it's going to find itself in the dysfunctional 50% plus of marriages that are ending badly. And so we see God's order for marriage, the love, the respect between a husband and a wife and the reciprocation of that. And and as a key principle of how marriage is supposed to work. There again, I haven't figured it all out, but we're trying to learn and do our best. Going on, it talks about God's order for for children. And uh, we might be... You might be uh, you might be in this in this section where it's like I'm just trying to get my kids raised. I'm trying to do a good job in raising my kids. And so let's let's look at this. God's order for children. And here again, I'll start off. It's a shorter passage, but um, I'll read the light and print, and if you can follow up as a class and read the bold print. Starting in Colossians chapter 3, you're continuing rather in Colossians chapter 3. And children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. So you have an ultimatum. As, as rearing children and bringing up children. And really, this command separates into, into two sections. Um, children still at home, uh, we're, we're to obey your parents if you're living at home. Uh, there's a couple of us maybe that fit into that category this morning. And if you're living at home, uh, we have a responsibility as living at home to obey your parents, unless it's against God's law or illegal. And if we're old enough and we can't live under our parents' rules, well, start out on your own. Adulting is rough sometimes, but that's a part of life. When I was a child, I hated that mantra. My house, my rules. Oh. You aren't someone else's kid. Johnny or Susie's doing it. Well, you're not Johnny or Susie. Well, their parents let them do it. Well, so-and-so aren't your parents. You're my child. You're my responsibility. And, and so I have to figure what's best for you. Now, now we're at the age of entering the stage of parenting, and we understand. Now we're the ones responding to the same sort of things that I said to my parents now we understand we are, uh, we are commanded by God to do our best in the upbringing of our own children in the ways of the Lord and trying to teach them to be respectable and good kids. Now, now we understand the life training and in a measure the success of that training really rests on my shoulders. The training of my kids It's my responsibility. So you fall into that category, even whether you're at home, falling under your parents' rules, and uh, and obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. But the second section is children that are outside of the home. How many are children this morning? Everybody. You're a child, somebody's child. Uh, you were brought into this world unless you're, well, let's not go down that track. You're somebody's child. And for that, we are to honor our parents. And here it may be tempting to check out on this part because, well, I'm not at home anymore. I'm living on my own or I have my own family or whatever you, you want to come up with and putting yourself in a section on that spectrum of life. However, this first command with promise is a lifelong command and a commitment to all of us because we're children. Now, 
Now I am on my own and I'm a parent and I see why this was important. I didn't so much when I was a child, this honoring your parents. We knew we had to do it because it was the, one of the big 10 of, uh, uh, one of God's big 10 and you had to do it or else. Um, but as a parent now, I see it. I see why it was important. What I did, the things that I said, the attitudes that I exhibited, um, all of that was a direct reflection on my parents who were doing their dead level best to uh, raise me in a godly and environment and direction. And in, in, in our life, as in, in, in our life uh, direction, our life has gone. Um, it's been magnified as we've had children because either I've been a pastor or now an administrator at the school. And it seems like um, people are watching your kids. As a pastor, the pastor's kids are supposed to be perfect. At least that's how I felt when I was pastoring. Uh, you're just supposed to have your kids in line because, you know, that was just the expectation. And as an administrator... Um, well, you're trying to take care of everybody else's kids, and if your kids are the ones that are acting out and being obnoxious and unruly, well, that doesn't work well either. Someone has the notion in their head, well, you need to get your own house in order. And not to unduly weigh the kids down. Kids will, kids will be kids. Kids need a childhood. But part of growing up and maturing as a person is thinking, how do my actions reflect on somebody else? But that responsibility to honor our parents still lives on until the day that you and I die. Uh, my actions, while my parents are not responsible for my actions anymore, my actions still reflect on my parents. They either honor or dishonor my parents. Now, maybe you don't think about that, but I really do. The legacy that I'm building through my life and endeavors to walk away that's God-honoring and what God wants in my life, the legacy that I'm building through my life either lifts up or diminishes the image of my parents. And if you don't feel that way, uh, that, that's fine. I, 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 but I feel that way. I understand that everyone has their own special set of circumstances. Some people have lived through through very traumatic situations that, that I haven't had to go through in my life. And so I'm not telling you what you should or should not or do what you should do or should not do. However, I just want to remind us this morning that the commandment still stands to honor our father and mother. And then to step into the spiritual realm, it's really no different with our heavenly father. Do do I honor in what we say and what we do and how we interact and how we act and react and all of those good things of life? Do, do I make my Heavenly Father, do I make God look good? Do my actions and reactions and attitudes and demeanor and legacy and respect, everything about me, does everything about me make someone else think favorably of my Heavenly Father or do my actions shame my father in heaven because of how his child acts? You getting what I'm saying this morning? We have an honor, we have a responsibility to honor our father and mother and honor our heavenly father as well. Everybody that's still with me, say I'm here. Good. Let's let's move on. God's order for parents. And uh, those of you who are parents, this is where we are. This is the road that we walk on this morning. And uh, we continue in Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, here, let's re read it responsibly. These two verses. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There are times that I feel like the man who, before he had children, had six rules or principles for raising children, and then one by one, six children came along, and he had no rules. We've, we've probably all uttered it at some point. Well, when I get my own home, things will be different. Yep. 
Now we have it. The wife, the kids, the stuff, the home, and yes, what are we going to do? And uh, in my short parenting um, uh, part of life, I've come to be very careful throwing stones from my glass house at other people's glass houses until my kids are raised and perfect. The reality is we aren't a dictator. We're not running some sort of military boot camp, unless that's the way that you've structured your home, then so be it. But rather, we are a conductor or a pace setter in our home for how our children are to be raised a guidance, a, a, a pointing in the right direction. And, and in the list of scriptures, fathers are given the word of caution, probably because uh, we've been given responsibility as the head or the leader of the home. Um, we're the ones that are, are, are the, the forerunner of what happens in our home. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it's a word of caution because some of us can probably be uh, more on the stern or the overwhelmingly bearing side, uh, overbearing side at some point. Uh, mothers are normally have the softer, more nurturing element. Um, in, in, my, in my home, my father was the soft-spoken one. And my grand, I think he, gets it for, he got it from my grandfather, who uh, in all of my years of existence when he was alive, I, I don't know that I ever heard my grandfather raise his voice. It was just his demeanor. Now, both my mom and my grandma, um, they, they have no fear of taking the bull by the horns and making the adjustment that's needed. But I think collectively here, it's a principle of, of raising the children and not provoking our, our children. Rather, together as a team, we're responsible uh, for the raising uh, our children, not with unreasonable commands or severity or, or being overbearing or with anger, but with a, with a nurturing attitude. And there again, I understand in, in a different context of homes that we grew up in, that may look a little different. Um, and that's not to be misconstrued with our society's non-discipline approach. The Bible talks about that with clarity as well, and we don't have time to get into that this morning. But to bring them up, we have a responsibility to train them. It's not the school or the church or the grandparents' role or responsibility, um, sole responsibility rather, but hopefully all of those entities are, are helping to uh, reinforce what we're teaching at home. But it's our job as parents to bring them up. Goes on, says, in the nurture, this is the training of a child, what they are to learn, a life of, uh, 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 for life and godliness, instructing them in how to be uh, um, uh, responsible people in society, discipline. Sometimes the Board of Education needs to see, meet the seat of understanding. The equator gets warmed. We go and get a tune up. If you're on my vein of thought this morning, there's the training. And there's the admonition of the Lord. Barnes says the word admonition here literally means putting in the mind. Then warning, admonition, instruction. The sense here, he says, is that they were to put them in the mind of the Lord, of his existence, perfections, laws, and claims on their hearts and lives. It echoes what Deuteronomy admonishes in Deuteronomy chapter 6, that, we were to, uh, we, that, that the Israelites were commanded they, um, that thou shalt teach them, their children, diligently, um, the, the commands diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them as a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thy eyes, and they shall write them upon the gates of thy house, and uh, the posts of thy house and on thy gates. What was the whole principle there? Well, it goes back to this admonishment, putting them in the mind of the Lord. The mind of the Lord should be stamped on them. Don't provoke them. Don't anger. Don't exacerbate. Don't enrage. My prayer as a parent has been, God, give me wisdom to raise my kids in such a way that they want to serve you. Don't let anything that I do hinder their view of you or their desire to serve you. And I understand we all make mistakes. We're not perfect. 
We make errors in judgment. But may God help us as parents to lead, to give admonition to our, our children. Quickly, I'm, gonna just, I'm just going to jump through this because my time is done. There was a story about two paddle boats, and they were going down uh, the Mississippi River, and the two boat captains decided they were going to have a competition. And so as challenges were made, they began trying to go faster and faster. And the one boat didn't have enough coal for a race, and so they ran out of coal. And so they began throwing luggage into the, into the compartment so that they could win the race. And they ended up winning the race, but they burnt their cargo and lost the precious things to them. And the reality is that God has entrusted cargo to us as parents, as spouses, our families, our, our own spouse, our children, our homes. And it's our job to make sure that our cargo reaches its destination, which is, which is heaven. And when programs take priority over people, people suffer. But the Bible puts great importance on the home and the family in building that family unit. God designed marriage of a man and a woman, the privilege of raising the responsibility of children. And at this very basic yet profound element, society is built. Healthy families are the foundation for strong schools and churches and communities and nations in the world. So I ask you this morning, is there anything that you need to do to strengthen your family? It's a question for consideration. Is there anything in your life that you need to do to strengthen your family, yes or no? If yes, I pray that we'd, we'd ask God to help us to do what we need to do to be that in our life. And if no, I want to sit down and take some counsel with you afterwards on how to do it perfectly. Let's stand this morning and let's close with the Lord's Prayer. I trust we'll do our part to raise, raise uh, strong families. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 